Okay, my introduction was very brief, but obviously Jeff is used to it because she's done it before. So, and so your introduction is just one sentence. She teaches biology at <coughs> Mills College. <laughs> as well without the microphone? Okay, excellent. So I am an evolutionary biologist and I study primarily social mammals. I study a variety of mammals and I'll tell you about some carnivores that I've worked on, some primates that I, um, some rodents, so lots of animals I've worked on and they all have the common theme in that they are social. And I'm going to start way back at the beginning of the theory of evolutionary biology. So when Charles Darwin originally proposed the idea of natural selection, he proposed that individuals should fight with each other over access to limited resources. And in fact, he suggested that natural selection should favor nature that's red in both tooth and in claw. And he worried that when he looked around at the natural world, there are many examples of cooperation. And in fact, he was worried that maybe the fact that cooperation is so prevalent in the natural world, we see um, lots of animals that cooperate in breeding and cooperate in a number of different ways, including the way humans cooperate. And it's possible that because cooperation is so prevalent, that in fact, this would really put a um, wrench in the theory of natural selection and several years ago, in fact 50 years ago now, W.D. Hamilton came along and he proposed this theory of kin selection. And kin selection was novel in that it's one way of explaining why an individual might act selflessly and help others by, and take a personal cost to themselves. And this idea is basically, the idea is to think about fitness of an individual. So an individual may behave in a certain way based on its actions. It will maybe pass on its genes to different extents. <coughs> it may, through inclusive fitness, benefit from directly gaining reproduction. So it may directly spread its genes. And this was pretty common standard evolutionary biology. What W.G. Hamilton did differently is that he then said, well, let's think about inclusive fitness. Let's, in addition, think about what our genetic relatives are doing. So it might be that even if I don't personally reproduce through my shared genes with my genetic relatives, I may indirectly be successful by helping my <laughs> genetic relatives. And there's enormous body of evidence suggesting that social insects, cooperative birds, naked mole rats, even a mammal, will give up their own breeding success to help their genetic relatives because of um, this kin selection idea. And in my work, I've, I've wanted to think about how kin selection may potentially favor cooperative behavior outside of mating. So is it possible that we do some friendly behavior, you do something nice for someone, we're not necessarily talking about reproductive sharing, but is it possible that I do something friendly and that helps my own genetic benefit through indirect sharing of genes with relatives? So I'm gonna take you on a quick snippet of a couple of different animals that I've been asking this question um, using long-term data sets. Uh, first, spotted hyenas in Kenya, and I've been asking do free-living mammals bias affiliative, and affiliative I just mean friendly behaviors, towards their genetic relatives? And do they bias harmful behaviors away from kin? Okay? So in a carnivore, does this work? Does the theory hold up? In a yellow-bellied marmot in Colorado, these are cat-sized rodents. And then finally, I recently started up a project on California ground squirrels over in the East Bay at Brioni's Regional Park. And in all of these different animals, I'm going to hit this question again and again and see if we get the same answer. So, for the first phase, do spotted hyenas cooperate with their genetic relatives? And to ask this question, this work brought me to Kenya. I lived in a tent for a year, and I worked on a project with Kay Holcamp and some collaborators. We're here in the Masai Mara Reserve in Kenya, and every day, twice a day, I'd wake up and I'd drive around in this field vehicle, and I'd locate hyenas. And I can identify who's who based on their spot patterns, 
and there are hundreds of them that live together in the same social group. Okay? And they are in these large groups and they come together sometimes and they come together under circumstances that allow them to cooperate. They also compete intensely with each other. Interestingly, in these groups that can be up to 120 hyenas, so they're very social for carnivores, uh, they also have more non-kin in their groups than most carnivores. They usually just have all genetic relatives. So they're a really interesting group of animals to ask about kin selection. And what's also interesting is they have a dominance hierarchy. And they have female-dominated societies. So in these social groups, the females are socially dominant to all of the males. And we can actually arrange, or they arrange themselves, in a linear dominance hierarchy. And it's structured based on who their family members are. Each of these family trees starts with an adult female and her offspring. And then the males are here with squares, and the circles represent females. And you can see that the alpha matrix line is the largest. Uh, they're having the most reproductive success. And below them, the second matrix line, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Each of the females in this matrix line are ranked with a dominance rank order. So they have a pecking order. Back your shoulders dominant to Murphy, Murphy's dominant to Seinfeld, all the way down. <laughs> and all the females are phylopatric, so they stay at home. And we can do this for the other females that are in this group, and then their offspring rank directly below them. And it turns out, guys, if you want to mate, you actually have to leave the group. So the females are staying home, but the males will actually, once they get to be reproductive age, they disperse. They go into a totally new group, and guess what? To, to join a new group, they have to come in all the way at the bottom. And those immigrant males are socially subordinate to all of the adult females. Okay? So when we think about cooperation, adult females are the best social allies. They wield the most power in these groups. And kinship theoretically should matter a lot. Interestingly, not all of the group members are related, so there's the opportunity to help both kin and non-kin. So if we take individuals from this social group, we can put them on a social network, and each one of these circles represents an individual hyena. The color represents the family group that they belong to. You can notice that the alpha female has the most, uh, the alpha matriline has the most members in it. The connections among these different uh, hyenas represent how often they're spending time with each other versus off on their own. And the thickness is pretty thick within. The lines are more connected within a family group than among family groups. And this is really resilient when there's not very much food around. When there's more food around, everyone is much more cooperative. They're spending more time together. And then when food goes down, again, over time, their ties are not as intense. But uh, they're always favoring their maternal relatives. Okay. So this suggests that there is some preference for spending time with female allies, but what are they actually doing when they're together in a group? So in the next set of questions, I asked if two females are fighting, so here's two hyenas, they're engaged in a fight. Hyena B, hyena C. Hyena A has the opportunity, she can get involved in this fight. If she does so, it's sort of a risk to herself, she could get injured, hyenas have big, teeth, and that's got to be bad if you get injured, um, she makes this decision to either, her opportunity to join, to either get involved, and when she does, kin selection theory predicts that she should help her genetic relatives, and she should target or direct this coalitionary fight towards an individual that she does not share genes with. So if kin selection theory works and explains this phenomenon, she should help B, but uh, direct the attack towards hyena C. Okay. So what do we do? We go out and we watch a lot of fights happening, and it turns out that oftentimes a female doesn't get involved, but per opportunity, she does this differently depending on who the different components are. So before we can address how related these individuals are and how that influences this cooperative behavior, we first need to genotype these hyenas. So what I did is I went out to Kenya, I darted a bunch of hyenas along with a lot of colleagues that did this over years. We isolated DNA from blood, and then we genotyped the individual hyenas. And this mattered because we wanted to know about both paternity and maternal relationships. We categorized 
categories of hyenas or pairs of hyenas based on whether they were mother daughters, full sisters. So they shared a lot of genes if they were close kin. Some of the distant kin were less related, and these would be half sisters, so they maybe had a different father or a different mother, aunts, nieces, grandmothers, and granddaughters. And then through this genotyping, we we're able to exclude individuals that were genetic relatives at all. We had a third category of unrelated non kin. So we predicted that kin, close kin should cooperate most often, and non kin should rarely cooperate. So what we found is a lot of different things. Um, there are many nuances to this figure. What I'd like to focus your attention on is per opportunity for a female to get involved in a fight, how often is she actually helping? And what you can see is regardless of whether that individual that she's helping is subordinate, dominant, subordinate, dominant to herself, that kinship is incredibly important in dictating who she helps and how often she helps per opportunity. So what you can see is that she's helping her close kin in black here more often than distant kin and more often than non-kin. So it's incredibly, incredibly important to help genetic relatives. And it matters whether there's food around or no food. So she's much more likely to help when there's no food around. And this is why I have a hyena skull that is here, oops, and a microphone that is there. Um, Hyenas have incredible jaws. They can eat 1.5 kilograms of meat per minute, and they're able to break through something as big as a giraffe leg bone. And because of that, any time taken out to help during food-related conflict is incredibly costly for the person or the hyena, in this case, that is helping. So they're much more willing to help when food is not immediately around, and you're seeing them helping much more often when there's no food. Um, if that doesn't work, thinking about the skull, here's a bunch of hyenas, and they're eating, 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 and food directly determines reproductive success, okay? We took this one step farther to see who they are beating up on when they are forming these coalitions. This network shows you each of the individual hyenas. The larger circles represent the hyenas of high social rank. The smaller circles represent lower rank individuals. What you can see is that the high-ranking individuals are directing their attacks all the way down the hierarchy towards the lower-ranked individuals. <laughs> they're always picking on someone they're already socially dominant to, and kinship does not protect them at all. So this was somewhat surprising. Cooperation is predicted by kinship, but who is actually receiving the aggression is not. Okay, so that's strange. Let's think about other animals. So this is in carnivores in Kenya. Um, let's go to Colorado. So when I was at UCLA, I went to Colorado and worked on this project with yellow-bellied marmots. It's been going on for over 50 years, another really long-term data set. And these guys are adorable, and there's even a marmot cake. And this is Dan Blumstein, who's currently overseeing the marmot project. This is at 10,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, in Gothic, Colorado. And we go up and we watch these marmots. And we actually have to paint on their backs little marks, and this is cherries, and you can start to recognize these individuals. They're not like the hyenas that have their own marks. Um, and I actually have a photo album here that you may look at during the break for the ground squirrels, the marks that we uh, draw on them, if you're just interested in how we do the work. So once we have the individuals marked, we can keep track of who's fighting with whom and who's being friendly. And I think I'm gonna show you a cute little video which is here, uh, let's see, okay. So these are some marmot pups. You can see on their backs they have some marks that we use to keep track of who's who. We record the social interactions when the two marmots come together. We record how often they're spending time together, and then we calculate a rate based on their time that's in close proximity, how often they're doing something that's friendly, and this is, these are bouts of play, and they'll sit around for a little bit, and then the one initiator will start a play bout, another one will respond, and this is quite playful, this is a friendly form of behavior. We also record things that are aggressive, so they do start to, particularly as they mature, they start to chase each other, and they will bite each other and do aggressive sorts of behaviors, and if you've ever run into rodent teeth, you know that they can also be quite dangerous. Okay, and it goes on and on and on. Um, 
But let's get to the data and think about the questions that I'm going to hit again. Does kinship predict how often they do this cute romping around behavior? Does that have potential benefits in socializing them? And then if they fight, are they less likely to fight their genetic relatives? So in addition to the play behavior where they're play wrestling, play mounting, those kinds of things, uh, we also recorded other friendly types of behaviors. And just like humans may greet if you say hello, that would be a friendly gesture. Uh, marmots do this, but they do it by rubbing noses. So this is a picture of them greeting. Um, they also will groom each other. That's got to be nice. They remove parasites and things like that. So they provide services in that way. And they huddle together, um, being in close proximity. And they tend to do that with their close affiliative um, allies. Okay. So then the question is, how does genetic relatedness play into this? And if we put in both paternal and maternal relatedness, does it predict how often they're doing these friendly behaviors? And indeed it does. And this pattern is remarkably consistent. So here I'm actually showing you 44 out of 46 different colony years. So it's a lot of data all lumped together. What I want you to pay attention to is this correlation. If it's positive, then this correlation coefficient, it means that there's a positive relationship between the proportion of genes they share and how often they're doing these friendly behaviors. The fact that it's positive and significant suggests that, in fact, kinship is structuring whether they do these behaviors. And this is true at the pup stage. So there are pups when they're born that first year. They hibernate. They come out of hibernation as yearlings, one-year-olds, and then they go back down as adults. So these cohorts are starting to play with each other uh, early in life, and this continues later in life, and it's patterned by how related they are to each other. Keep your eye on this axis. Remember that if kin selection is protecting individuals from fights, we'd actually expect them to be less likely and have a negative relationship with how genetically, how many genes they share. But in fact, what we find is this pattern looks almost identical. So I've switched it, and I have a blue, uh, blue words up here to keep track that this is kin, kins are kin are are close friends, um, and kin are also the closest competitors in this group. So the data look remarkably similar, and it turns out that their closest allies in these societies are also the closest competitors. Okay. So what about in ground squirrels? And this is where we're, I'm going to give you a teaser uh, for the work that we've started up in 2013. We have many squirrels that we've sampled, hundreds now, um, and we're asking similar kinds of questions about the relationship between kinship and cooperation. And these squirrels live in little burrows that are here, and we study them out at Brioni's Park in the East Bay. And they cooperate in a number of ways. I'll show you one way that they cooperate. And just to orient you on here, this is the burrow where the squirrel lives. And the, there's also a rattlesnake that is in this burrow. This is the presumed mother that we've been watching. Her name is Double Carrot. She's now four years old. And um, we just saw her. And she has two presumably offspring that are here. I'm going to show you a cooperative behavior that she's engaged in. And what these squirrels do, I don't know if you can hear that, she's alarm calling. She's also puffing her body up. She's tail flagging. She's heating up her tail. She heats up her tail differently depending on whether um, it's a rattlesnake or a snake without pits that senses heat. Um, and she's doing this cooperative behavior, and presumably she's doing it because these are her genetic relatives. So one of the questions that we're asking is whether uh, we're basically genotyping these squirrels, and we're trying to understand the extent to which this cooperative behavior um, occurs differently based on the role of kinship. We are also similarly with the work with the uh, uh, marmots. We're quantifying all of these affiliative behaviors. There's a play slap, but you know uh, they also do fight with each other. So we're trying to ask what are the relationships between kinship and these friendly forms of behavior. One of the things we're doing with these networks, these are pairs of squirrels, and each of these squirrels would be a node or a circle on the network. And one of the ways that we're tracking their patterns of association is through 
these data loggers. So we basically have these little loggers that we sit in the burrow entrance. As the squirrel goes in and out, they have a microchip, just like you might put on your dog, and it scans them as they go in and out of the burrows. So we have an automated, automated reader, just like scanning something at the grocery store every time the squirrel goes in and out, and we can build up associations to build our networks based on that. We go out with lots and lots of students, and we track these squirrels, so we collect DNA samples, hormone samples, other types of information, and eventually we're building up this um, pedigree based on hair that we've collected, other DNA samples, and the pedigree will tell us about the relationships with kinship. And eventually I'll be able to tackle the evolutionary question of why cooperation occurs, and one possible explanation for that is this theory of kin selection. And with that, I'd like to thank all the millions of students that have contributed to this work and the funding agencies, and thank you for listening.